Hey folks, welcome back to Black and White. Here in Opelucid City, heading off to Route 11 and the beginning of Eastern Unova. Now you can start exploring Eastern Unova either from the north or south, but I'm going for the north because that's how I roll. Starting with Route 11, because I like to do things in order. Now these guys, uh, there are a couple French trainers on this route. This one says, hey, let me fight you so that I can remember our encounter. And then goes all poetic and he's like, the places we've seen, the people we've met, the Pokemon with whom we've crossed iron, will remain forever engraved in our memory. Which is cool, and I don't know if it's just because it's French that it sounds fancy, but whatever. Anyway, these various routes, um, most of the wild Pokemon here will be wild Pokemon from previous generations rather than new Unova Pokemon. Still a couple new ones, but, uh, not too many. And unfortunately, as post-game goes, this is just basically a couple routes with some more items and trainers to fight. There's no real drive to explore them unless you want to see what's there, which is, I guess, reason enough. But it, there's nothing exceptional here other than one Team Plasma Sage and a certain trainer about halfway through. But other than that, some TMs, some items, and the chance to see some classic Pokemon from previous generations. So as you can tell, uh, this area, and most areas beyond this, require a lot more HM usage to traverse. Now that you're in the post-game, you're expected to be willing to do that, be able to shift around your team and use some other Pokemon. So surfing, waterfalling, things like that. There will be some strength use later. Now one person yelled at me uh, because I fished into a rippling water spot rather than surfed into it, even though they both result in different Pokemon that are special. So here we are, surfing into it, and here you can see a previous generation Pokemon, Weasel. Weasel was introduced in fourth generation as another water type array. Which, it wasn't too bad, there weren't that many water types in Sinnoh, but still, Weasel was not the most memorable. But uh, Ash did use one in the TV series, so it's okay. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel, Miss Ranger Person. Oh, those, uh, those are beer, ca beer cans. Those, those are beer cans. Anyway, second French person here. You couldn't imagine how many countries I've visited, how many trainers I've fought. Once I've traveled far and wide, I can return to my family with many stories to tell. Now, those trainers were also foreign in other versions of the game. In the Japanese version, one was French and one was English, but they, they've preserved foreignness. Now, here's a black exclusive Pokémon, who I think was available earlier, but, uh, like on Route 10 or something. This is Vullaby. It's like a vulture thing. You'll see its evolved form soon. And I would show its white counterpart, except you will see its white counterpart in a much more glorious setting later on, so I will hold off there. And the Protector. Protectors are a hold item that are used to evolve Rhydons into Rhyperiors. Uh, 
you have them hold it and trade it with them and they will evolve. Now then, double battle here, showing off two Pokémon who I believe I have not shown off before. Uh, that is Amoongus, evolved form of Fungus, and Mandibuzz, evolved form of that Volibee that you just saw. Now as you can see, the wild Pokémon in these areas are pretty darn high level. Higher level than most of my Pokémon are. And granted, they don't have, like, EVs and whatnot, so they're not trained, and so they're hypothetically weaker, but... Things don't always go my way in the wild battles here. And a lot of the trainers do also have higher level Pokémon. It is a good post-game in that regard, in that you will probably be challenged by the higher level Pokémon that trainers have. But it's just nothing too exceptional. Anyway, this is kind of a bad situation for me, because Verlang is probably not going to be able to uh, take whatever that Amoongus has in store. Yeah, Solar Beam, probably not on my list of things that I am likely to survive. And unfortunately, that Mandibuzz is a jerk and avoided the Rock Slide, so, revives. I'm showing this fight A because it's a double battle, B because it has the evolved forms, and C because it pushes me to the limit. And also seeking a Solar Beam. I think Solar Beam could use some cool lighting effects to make it more badass, but whatever, I'll let it pass. And here I was a little confused because I realized how to switch in a lecture. Because I'm an idiot. Anyway, Electra is kind of awesome, so uh, I can kind of resist most of what these guys have to offer. But you'll see me, like, not necessarily being able to use my most ideal type matchup, either because it's already fainted, or because it's just not strong enough to take whatever the opponent has. And there that goes down, and uh, that was your wonderful, amazing, wild battle of the day. And that more or less wraps up Route 11. There isn't a whole lot here, unfortunately. And that's kind of going to be the story for a lot of the routes here. Let's see, whoopsie daisy, up we go. And let's head on to... the Route Divider. And then on to... The Village Bridge. Or, or Bridge Village. I, either way really works. This is a village that was constructed on a bridge because there was massive flooding back in the day and they decided, well, we should probably avoid that. So rather than just like relocating to higher ground, they decided to build their entire village on a bridge which could break. I don't know. Anyway, this person is the replacement for the Pokemon Center. There is no Pokemon Center here, unfortunately. And I'm just going to check out all the houses. There's uh, nothing particularly noteworthy in any of them. But, you know, just some lore, some backstory. Carvana. Carvana is the uh, piranha Pokemon introduced in the third generation as a pre-evolution to Sharpedo. It's a water dark type, and it's pretty rad. We will not be seeing it. Here's a little throwback to Heart Gold and Soul Silver. The Poke Athlon was a replacement for the Pokemon contests. Just a new way to get items. 
more interesting than just talking to people or getting it from bushes or whatever. Only 200? Really? Come on. Young people. And here's that backstory here. Unfortunately, if the river floods more, it won't help. So, maybe not the best idea, guys. I mean, they even live next to a route with a bunch of hills. So, it seems to me like it'd be a good idea to just uh, relocate to higher ground. Anyway, there are some trainers in this town of sorts. Remarkably, and there's wild Pokemon even. And this is another town with those uh, multiple audio layers, so certain people that you can talk to will add uh, certain certain tracks to the music. And I do like that surfing doesn't interrupt the music of the town. Getting an item does, of course. Now the vocals here actually do have actual lyrics. They're they're Japanese, but they do actually mean something. They're an old man reflecting on how he's come to the sunset of his life. And it's something along the lines of I am a geezer standing in the dusk, mesmerized by the gulls. Gazing fixedly into the sapphire sea, I bemoan with shed tears as I yearn for the lovely gulls soaring above the blue harbor. Now this is a village on a river, not a harbor. There are no goals here. And there is a town very much fitting of the song's lyrics, but it's not this one. So I don't know. I don't know what to believe. It's weird. And here we have the main attraction of the village, if there is one. It's a sandwich shop, but in order to access it, we have to beat this person in a battle. Now, I actually kind of like this battle. It's not hard at all, but I think the Pokemon choice for the trainer is actually pretty clever, because they're both related to honey, even though they're completely different types and species and whatever. Uh, a combi, and as you'll be about to see, a ring, both are related to honey. One is a honeycomb, and one is a honey bear. It's like, cool, you can associate completely unrelated things and make them fit together, and it's neat. I do kind of wish the Combi had been a Vespi Queen. I have no idea why it wasn't, but okay, whatever, alright, sure. Anyway, uh, Combi was introduced in the fourth generation as a somewhat difficult to find a honey tree Pokemon. You would slather honey on a tree, and then 12 hours later you would uh, have a slight chance of, of getting one. And then Ursa Ring's evolution of Teddy Ursa introduced in the second generation. Not too notable except being awesome. And Cindy is getting really far ahead in terms of experience. We should do something about that. Now then, after beating her, we can do a little mini game that we can repeat each uh, once per day. So this is an amazing memorization game where you talk to the trainers in any order you like and then talk to them again in the same order. I mean, you sort of have to remember a, a four-berry sequence, but it's not difficult if you have trouble remembering. You, you have other things to worry about. generally they won't do, like, 
four completely unrelated berries. I think I've always had at least one duplicate. Now, I don't know if I've already mentioned this, but uh, the names of every berry are kind of altered versions of actual, real-life berries or fruits. So, Pecha is peach, cherry is banana, clearly. I just think it's a neat little clever thing. And as a result, you will get a special berry, a good berry. Lumberries are a rather rare berry, actually, that uh, are generally used in the metagame for various sets. Lumberries are neat because they will actually heal any status condition. They're basically the berry equivalent of a full heal, except it's a hold item, so it can happen automatically. Now note this old man. He actually provides a very interesting contrast to the people in the next city, next city to the east. Anywho, that takes care of the village bridge, so uh, let's heal once again, and head on to Route 12. Now, as mentioned in the Village Bridge, Route 12 is a route full of small hills that are like, good for athletic training or something. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually change gameplay at all, it just makes your sprite move up a little bit once in a while. And you can just follow a path to avoid all of it anyway, so... It's entirely possible to just cruise the, through this route not fighting anything. Anywho, because the geography of this route isn't actually very interesting, let's talk about the Pokémon you can find here. Uh, most of the Pokémon here are thematically fitting of a grassland. You can find Metapod, Kakuna, Sunkern, Cherim, Combi. Uh, cool things like Heracross and Finsir, actually. Uh, Tranquil once in a while. But then you can also find Rapidash. It's really weird. Like, what is a Rapidash doing there? That Rapidash should not be there, that's silly. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. But unfortunately, Rapidash is kind of the only weird thing you'll find there, otherwise it's just stuff you'd normally find in a grassland. Anyway, uh, Energy Ball uh, would be useful, and probably is useful, except I already have it on the low, so I don't really need the TM. Anyway, uh, I think there are a bunch of items hidden around here if you use the dowsing machine but I think they're mushrooms, and mushrooms are for losers. Or I never use them anyway. Here we are five, and I believe that takes care of basically everything on of interest on this route. It's a small route. Oh, oh, this guy, yeah. This guy actually is somewhat notable. Not notable enough to show the fight, but uh, he has the Weedle evolutionary line as his team. But he's not a bug catcher, because bug catchers are not a class in this game. They just don't exist. He's a, he's a school kid instead, even though he could totally be a bug catcher. Interesting, if you're a nerd. Anyway, this here is Lacunosa Town. This is our stopping point for today. And that takes care of that, so I will see you guys next time.